What's up guys, welcome back. In this episode, we're gonna talk about some more 3D printed metal parts. In this case, the intake manifold, which was done in laser-centered aluminum. It was sourced through our friends at CraftCloud, and if you missed the previous episode, I designed a turbo manifold in CAD and then used CraftCloud services to get that 3D printed in Inconel. The process for this was pretty similar, but there's gonna be some additional assembly and post-processing, so we're gonna check that out in this video. So we're not going to spend a lot of time in Fusion 360, but I wanted to take a moment to show that the underlying tools that were used to build uh, the intake runners are the same that I demonstrated on the previous video for the turbo manifold. Each runner consists of two sketch profiles connected by a loft using a spline as a centerline guide path to control the shape of the runner. Then each one was hollowed out with a shell tool and then all combined to form the intake manifold. I'd love to tell you that the whole design process went super smooth, but I learned a lot along the way and made a ton of mistakes in the workflow and my approach on how I designed the intake. After I sent the files out for 3D printing, I ended up exporting all of the components as step files to save on all the overhead that the timeline was consuming every time I wanted to make a small change. But after all the files were done, I uh, sent them out to CraftCloud. You can see the prices of each of the components. If you go to the description below, you'll find a discount code for 10% off your first order with CraftCloud. If you ended up with an intake manifold of comparable dimensions to the one shown here, that would get you $200 off that order. When you receive a 3D printed aluminum part, it's probably gonna look something like this with a nice matte gray finish. Uh, when the parts come off the printer, there's usually some support removal or some light cleanup sanding that's done. And then they go through and sandblast the part to give it a nice uniform finish. This makes for a really nice looking part and it's pretty much ready to use as is unless you have to do any welding to it. One thing to be aware of is that the sandblasted finish picks up grease and fingerprints very easily. So you're gonna wanna be careful about keeping this clean before you put any sort of coatings on it. If you are going to weld it, the sandblasting inherently embeds some impurities in the surface, so you're going to want to go through with a sanding disc or a flap wheel and just clean up any of your weld joints to make sure you have a nice clean base metal to weld to. Uh, when you do get to welding, expect it to weld just like any other cast aluminum part. If you've ever welded an elbow to a compressor housing or something similar like a um, oil drain back fitting to an oil pan, uh, expect similar results. The first step of post-processing that I did was to tap all of the required holes. All of the holes were printed to the correct drill size, so all we had to do was run the tap through them. Of course, after adding some tap magic for lube to ensure that the threads cut nice and clean without any galling of the metal. On the inlet plenum, I designed a tap fixture to make sure that the tap went in nice and straight and perpendicular to the surface. The studs are quite long and 80 millimeters, and any angular misalignment of the tap is going to be horribly apparent when you go to try and install the throttle body. This did the job of keeping the studs nice and straight, and we don't have any issues when we go to install the parts afterward. As mentioned earlier, you want to make sure that your weld joints are nice and clean, so we're going to go through and clean all those up with a sanding disc on a die grinder. After tack welding the first coolant end cap into position, we're going to go through and finish weld it all the way around. In this case, I used 1 16th inch diameter 4043 filler. Then we're going to go through and weld the other end on. The next step was to pressure test the end caps to make sure that they were free of leaks. If there was a leak, it may not be easily accessible to fix after the inlet plenum and lower intake are welded to the assembly. In order to pressure test it, I ordered two cheap Dash 12 ORB plugs off Amazon, one of which was simply threaded into one of the coolant ports. The other I chucked in the lathe. This was done in order to use an eighth inch NPT Schrader valve in order to pressurize the assembly. I actually don't have a full air compressor in my garage, so I just used a Milwaukee M12 tire inflator to generate the required pressure. In this case, we tested it to 40 PSI, 
put it underwater to look for any air bubbles escaping and everything sealed up nice and tight. Since we had no apparent leaks, the next step was to weld the inlet plenum on. For the next part of the process, we needed to ensure that the injector o-rings would have a nice smooth surface in which to seal against. The as printed injector bung surface is not smooth enough to get a consistent seal, so the method that I chose to achieve a reasonable surface finish was a 14 millimeter flex hone. The flex hone was something on the order of 20 or 25 bucks and then provided a nice means of slowly removing material to get us to the correct finish. I had the access holes for the shank of the hone 3D printed in the intake so everything lined up with the ports. They were a little bit undersized so I had to go through and open them up with a quarter inch drill bit. From there just systematically went through each hole until each had an even finish all the way through. After the o-ring surfaces were all finished up, we then headed to the belt sander to sand the flange flat. No! God, please, no! No! So based on my last video, a few of you are probably headed to the comments right now to rage type something about how it's impossible for a belt sander to make a flange flat. Now, flat is a relatively meaningless term in a manufacturing sense unless you have some context and tolerance to it. It's sort of like asking how long is a string. Well, the good part is we can quantify flatness and we do so with a ground straight edge and a feeler gauge. The smallest feeler gauge that I have is two thousandths of an inch or 0 0.051 millimeters in thickness. And that's actually convenient for us because the general rule of thumb for flatness on a cylinder head with the expectation to seal a head gasket with a thousand plus PSI, combustion pressure, oil and coolant, all that nastiness is about one thou of allowable tolerance per cylinder. In our case, we're going to consider the rotary a two cylinder engine and thus a two thou feeler gauge is just about perfect. And so basically what you're going to want to do is set up your straight edge on the longest run to get the best possible indication of how flat this is or how flat it might not be and you basically just want to keep pressure in one spot you don't want to rock the straight edge because that'll give you a false reading but we've got our two thou and if we work our way all the way across the flange you can obviously see the pressure that i'm putting on it to deform the feeler gauge and if we run it I don't know about you, but that's flat within two thou. It's probably one and a half thou. I would say if the belt sander did any better than that, it's probably pretty generous. And we'll take the part in question that everybody had a problem with on the last video. And if we do the same thing. We are good to go. Now, if you used my bench top as a reference, you would be very correct in thinking that this wasn't flat. However, the manifold is flat, the bench is not. And if we want to just see how not flat my bench is, One of the key objectives for this build is to utilize tools and processes that are available to the average home builder or small fabrication shop. Sure, I could have farmed out the flattening to a machine shop who's going to fix it in a mill and cut it flat. However, I have a belt sander and I know that I can achieve a reasonably flat flange that will seal well enough for our purposes because gaskets exist and their purpose is to take up small irregularities in the surface in order to obtain a good seal. For the naysayers that doubt the ability of a belt sander to produce an acceptably flat flange, I don't know what sort of equipment or barbaric methods you're using, but is a belt sander the best method to achieve an acceptably flat flange? No. 
Is a milling machine the only method to achieve an acceptably flat flange? Also, no. Don't at me, bro. So with that out of the way, let's get a little bit more into the lower intake manifold and some of the design features. So if we start at the top of the manifold, you can see the super clean text on the twin power turbo logo that I've replicated to give it that OEM BMW look. On the left side, we have our temperature map sensor. This is going to be the post intercooler one, obviously, and that's the one that we're going to tune our engine with. On the other side, we've got a pressure port that's going to feed the blow off valve on our compressor housing. And then we have some bosses for the methanol injection nozzles that we may or may not install. But if we do decide to do that, they are ready to go. There's already a countersunk drill point on the top of them. And then on the back side, the bore is sized appropriately for the NPT tap that we're going to need. And if you go down the runners, you get a nice super smooth transition into the flange. More really crisp detail on the hexagons that we put in there just for some nice visual detail as well as lightening up the flange and minimizing the amount of material. Whenever you 3D print something in metal, you're, there's really no infill, it's all 100%. So you're paying for the mass of the metal and the energy used to weld everything together. So by putting features in like this, it's gonna reduce your overall cost. So you wanna do that wherever possible. One interesting thing that I noted, you got a couple of ribs here that seem to be artifacts from the mesh. Um, I actually went back and looked at the STL and they're present there that I didn't really notice before I had it printed. The inside is super smooth and it's really strange because these runners were mirrored from these, but none of that is apparent on this side from the mesh. So just kind of a weird thing how Fusion exported uh, the mesh on that side. But regardless, it still looks great and uh, it's not really too noticeable. If we flip that over, the flange was already belt sanded to be nice and smooth. Uh, so we have a nice clean gasket surface probably removed maybe a quarter of a millimeter. Uh, it was actually really flat to begin with, uh, which was good to see for a part that was this big. Oftentimes you'll get a little bit of distortion or um, shrinkage. So that, that worked out really well. If you move into the plenum area, you have our velocity stacks, which came out really nice. One thing to be aware of is if you have any overhangs in tight areas, as I said, that there is support material that's used and they did a pretty good job of removing material, but there was still some leftover support material. You see it's kind of like a metallic mesh. And so I went through and then scraped anything out behind here, used a stainless steel wire bottle brush and a drill just to get any of the last remaining bits out. So now that's, that's nice and clean. We don't have to worry about any little bits of debris getting in our motor and causing us to have a really bad day. Another thing to note is when I placed the order for this, communication was actually really good for the vendor that I used. The vendor had actually reached out to warn of some possible rough surface finish on the top of the intake ports behind the velocity stacks here and on one side of the injector. I was actually a little bit concerned when they were talking about a rough finish because they weren't really able to give a good uh, example of what rough finish would look like, but I pulled the trigger anyway and at the end of the day, it's actually not too bad. It's probably a surface finish that's equivalent to what you might find on a number of OEM cast manifolds. So that wasn't really bad at all. So on the injectors, you see these are not all on the same plane. This was done to make sure that we had the optimum uh, nozzle placement within the geometry of the runners. Ideally, these are a little bit closer to the port, which should help improve drivability a little bit. Ideally, I would have liked to run the factory injectors in the center plate, but I just didn't have enough room for a fuel rail on that side. Plus this rail uh, just was too tight of a package. Instead of doing a CNC fuel rail, I basically just use some injector spacers, which are typically used if you're gonna run um, the short injector dynamic style in a factory fuel rail that's designed for a taller injector. And the main reason that I did that was to just be able to use the tools that I had available in my garage. I machined this fuel rail basically in a drill press with a clamp and everything came out really well. 3D printing came in handy for the fuel rail as well as I designed a 
basic little clamp fixture that would hold the irregular shape of the fuel rail. I bought a bit specifically designed for drilling uh, fuel injector holes. Not only does the pilot, but the finished O-ring diameter as well in one operation. The final operation for the fuel rail was the provision for the Bosch temperature pressure sensor. I then used a nine millimeter spotting drill bit. This gave us required 45 degree seat angle of the Bosch pressure sensor also gave us the proper drill size for the M10 thread tap. This was another item that we wanted to pressure test for leaks, considering the 13B that I got came out of a car that burnt to the ground from a potential fuel leak. I wanted to make sure that that wasn't a repeat scenario in this car. Now we have our inlet plenum side. We have another temperature map sensor. This is gonna give us our pre-intercooler air temps as well as our pre-intercooler boost. Then from there, we can understand how much temperature drop we have, how much pressure drop we have. Bosch 68 millimeter drive-by-wire throttle. Uh, we'll take that off. We've got about 10 millimeters of material for thread engagement. Uh, for an M6 fastener. With the aluminum, I didn't want to have a bolt that's being threaded in and out every time I had to service the car. So we have the, uh, the studs Loctited in and hopefully that should provide a more long-term reliable fastening solution. And then we have a groove with an O-ring to, to seal the throttle body to the intake. So this side has a wall that divides the center. It's not welded to the core, nor does it have to be. The water is going to flow through the path of least resistance, so that's going to be through the bottom of the core, around the back, and then back out the outlet. If we ever got to a situation where water would want to flow between the dividers, uh, that would mean that one section of the intercooler is completely blocked, and then we've got bigger issues to contend with. At that point, the whole thing's probably junk anyway. And with that, we position and finish well the lower intake, thus completing our 3D printed aluminum intake manifold. So I'm really stoked how this came out. Even considering the assembly effort, this was much less work than attempting the same geometry with traditional fabrication techniques. I still have yet to powder coat the intake and normally I would do a black wrinkle with exposed aluminum on the raised text for most actual BMW parts, but I might consider alternatives for better aesthetics in the small engine bay. Uh, drop a line in the comments if you have any ideas. Uh, some final thoughts on 3D printing an intake. If I had to do mine again, I would perhaps extend the velocity stacks out a little bit further to gain some more runner length and make it easier for support removal. Uh, it would also be a good idea regardless to do a two-piece intake to inspect the internals before running it on a motor. If you made it this far, uh, thanks for watching. The next episode, we're gonna take a bit of a side quest and take a look at the 3D scanning hardware that I use and how I integrate that into my workflow. See you next time.